Thank you, Melissa, and thanks very much for inviting me. Um, this is really nice and, and, and an honor to um, have a chance to talk to you. I'm not going to say very much that's scientific in my talk. I'm really going to be trying to um, give you a flavor of where all this science that you're doing and that, that meteorological scientists do actually translates into the services of the Bureau. Okay, so where the rubber hits the road. Um, and before I start, I'd, I just have to acknowledge that a lot of the slides and material I've pitched <coughs> from many, many of my colleagues um, in Australia and overseas. So, okay. Um, so what I'll talk about today, um, hopefully in the com coming hour, it will be the Bureau's warning services. And then we'll talk about how those warning services actually are generated. And, and an awful lot goes into them, maybe more than you might think. And so we'll, we'll talk about something called the weather information value chain. Um, what sits behind all the, all the warnings that get made. Um, and then we'll actually go through a little exercise about creating a new type of a warning and the thunderstorm asthma service, which does now exist. Um, it's a brand new service, but we'll, we'll um, go through an exercise to develop it ourselves and see what we can, what we can do. And then if I have time, I'll finish off with um, towards more information, uh, more effective warnings um, and moving towards impacts. Okay, um, the Bureau's got a very ambitious goal now. Um, we've been reorganized, and our um, services division's goal is zero lives lost due to weather <coughs> hazards. Um, it's a hard to achieve goal, but it, it is um, in many ways within our grasp in coming years because the science is getting better, and the science of how to deliver services is also getting better. And so a lot of what I'll talk about a little bit later today is getting people to pay attention because you know, we can have the best science in the world, but if people don't act, um, lives will continue to be lost. Um, as you know, the, the Bureau's key responsibility is to protect, uh, provide information <coughs> to uh, protect life and property. And so we need to provide the right warning products. What should they be to the right people? Who are they at the right time? When is that? with that information that they need so that they can act appropriately. So we have um, a whole long list of hazard warning services and they're undergoing a, an audit and a review um, with a view to improving them. But you can see that they, they sort of fall into a couple of different areas. So there's a number of water hazards to do with flooding mainly um, of, of different sorts. Um, tsunami, of course, which doesn't happen very often, but if it does, it can be terrible and coastal flooding. Um, just our, our weather and marine forecasts, um, the public types of forecasts, um, normally aren't of the warning variety, but there are a number of um, particular elements in there that fall into those categories. We have very specific warnings, like for sheep chill, if sheep get cold and wet in, in the wind. We have downy mildew for the, the wine growers, um, and a whole lot of those kinds of things. Um, and we have a new service on um, rock fishing. So in, in New South Wales, <coughs> you may be aware that sometimes people like to go and fish off the rocks, and sometimes a, a freak wave will come and wipe them out, uh, you know, wipe them off the rock, and pe people have died. So we have warning service out for that now as well. Um, but really, this, the ones on the right, the extreme weather, that's where most of our warning services live. Um, fire weather probably something that you're all familiar with. Heat wave, you've, I know you've been talking about heat wave this week. Tropical cyclones, um, a big thing for Australia, although it kills a lot fewer people than heat wave. Thunderstorms and severe weather, Rob's just given us a great talk on what goes into that. Thunderstorm asthma, a new service. And national multi-hazards, so trying to work towards, um, we might say compound events in, in the, the local scale. And with most of these things, it's not just <coughs> we issue the warning. There's a lead up. There's an outlook where we're looking ahead. Um, maybe it's, it's weeks or months even if we know that it's a season that's going to be more conducive to severe weather. Um, but at the least, it's going to be something like a week or something, and enabling people to plan. Then when we see that the, um, through our modeling primarily, um, that the thing's looking like it's getting more likely, we might issue what we call a watch. And that's just um, telling not just the public, but this goes to a lot of agencies and industry that be prepared, this thing could happen. Um, and then once we have uh, 
a, a more sure idea that it's happening, or as one of my colleagues say, once we see the whites of its eyes, we issue a warning, and that means take action now. <coughs> so um, this, is, this is a picture, and it's, it's a little hard to read because the writing's small, of what we might call the weather information value chain. And the warnings sit right at the right-hand side of that. So forecast and warning services and the customers are there to receive it and take the benefit from those warnings. But actually, there's an awful lot that sits behind that. Um, we start with the observations. We have numerical modeling. Um, we have data products and post-processing, which might be something that you don't think about very much, and forecast systems. Um, and then we make our, our forecasts and warnings. So, so I'll, I'll take you through these. Um, and give you a little bit uh, deeper flavor of what's involved there. So we'll start with the observations. As you all know, um, one of the roles of a weather agency like the Bureau is to make weather observations. Um, we have the radio songs, weather stations, um, rain gauges. Um, we make observations at sea from buoys, um, snow meters. This is probably off of a slide from the United States. I don't think we do have much in the way of snow. Um, we don't make satellite observations ourselves here, by and large, but we collect lots and lots and lots and lots, and then on the right, a radar. And there's, there's other instruments that aren't on here, but these are the, really the major ones. Um, and so if you want to make a, a warning straight off of, the now, off of the observations, you can do that, and that's called nowcasting, where you might observe that something is happening, and you can put in some, some clever stuff to extrapolate it forward in time, and maybe based on the observations, you might evolve it a little bit if it seems to be growing or shrinking or, or going around a corner or something like that. Um, and they're typically spatial. Um, radar nowcasts are, are what have been around the longest, and this is an example of a, a rainfall nowcast. Um, but we can do it from satellite. We can do it from lightning. We can do it from any kind of observation, really. It's an extrapolation. Um, but it's only really good for a couple of hours, so we need better tools than that. Um, and so increasingly, um, because numerical weather prediction models are starting to assimilate these observations, the dividing line between a forecast or a nowcast made from observations and a very short-term forecast made from a model that has the observations stuffed in that's starting to be a very um, fuzzy kind of line, which, which is good because um, the models you can think of as a, a very clever interpolator and with physics. So if, if we think about the um, global set of observations, um, this is the picture that our modelers like to show of all of the different kinds of observations that go into the models. And so the synoptic observations in the ships in the upper left, when we think about weather observations, we might think about AWS's automatic weather stations as, as the first th thing we think of. But if you look down at the, the next line and the, and the following line from the satellites, that's, there's way, way, way more um, information getting into the models from that. And in fact, the number is around about 4 million observations every six hours get stuffed into <coughs> the models, and 95% of that satellite. But if you look at what is the most important, and depending on how you measure, which uh, per observation, what, what has the most impact, it's actually radio suns. So good old traditional radio suns with vertical profiles um, per instrument have the most impact. So if you're trying to rationalize your network, be careful about cutting radio suns because we need them. Okay. Um, numerical weather prediction models, um, I think most people here are, are a bit familiar with them. Um, you're familiar with the climate model? Well, it's, it's essentially the same kind of a thing <laughs> on the grid, um, all the physical processes. But the main difference between climate modeling and numerical weather prediction is the initialization. So we're starting with the, the observed state and integrating from there. And so the, the whole process of data assimilation or model initialization is quite a complex one. There's an awful lot of mathematics, and maybe some of the more mathematically inclined among you might like to work on that because it's a really, really important area. And in fact, Many, if not most, of the advances in numerical prediction over the last couple of decades have not come from better physics. That's still important. But it's more coming to do with better data assimilation and better data and use of that data. So it's a really, really important aspect. 
um, the excess model is what we use in the Bureau for our numerical weather prediction. It's part of the excess whole, um, larger modeling system that includes climate, includes seasonal prediction as well. Um, and so if we're using it in climate mode, we've got lots and lots of subcomponent models in it for the land surface, for the ocean, for chemistry, for, um, for um, dynamic vegetation and things like that. The NWP part of it for weather prediction is really that top bit. So we currently in the Bureau um, don't couple it to the ocean. We take ocean conditions as input, but it's not a two-way thing. Um, in the ECMWF in, in Europe, it's actually coupled to the ocean as well. And so we'll eventually get there, but we're not there now. Um, most of the modeling that we do in the Bureau is what we would call deterministic. So we have one set of initial conditions and we integrate in time. But as you'd be very aware, um, ensemble prediction is the way of the future, or it's, it's the way of now, and we're just catching up here in Australia, where um, instead of running it once, you run it many times with slightly different initial conditions. And you might also have slightly different model settings or, or model physics, or you might even have a couple of different models that you're putting together. But the key thing being that you have several integrations of, of forecasts um, or several, several inputs. And from that, you can derive probabilities. You can look at scenarios. You can get towards risk. And risk is really where we're trying to go to get better warnings. So most of the warnings that we will develop in future are going to be based on ensembles. And in fact, in Europe, they are already. So I'll say a few words about excess um, weather modeling. You've seen the slide that Andy showed this morning, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. Um, the latest version of the city scale model, which are the little red boxes, and we have a number of them because we can't do the whole country at that scale on our computer. We'd like to, but we can't yet. So we, we put a number of domains over population centers. Um, we're now at one and a half kilometers resolution. And the latest upgrade has been fantastic because what we've done is we've gone from um, parameterizing the convection to explicitly allowing the model to do its own convection. And that's made a really big positive difference to um, particularly rainfall, but the wind and the, and the other forecasts are also better as well. So this, is, this has been a big change. And for forecasters who are using the models when they're making their forecasts, they now have um, really quite explicit representations of those w mesoscale weather, which is, which is great. Now, a problem is that they only have one. We really need an ensemble. So that's where we're going to next. Um, on the, on the, the bottom line, so it's at where it says excess C3, C E3, that's going to be the same one and a half kilometer model, but um, in an ensemble mode. And so we'll run it probably once each hour and then we'll have a, a lag of, of forecasts that we can use. Um, we also will have a global ensemble. Finally, we've been running global ensembles in the Bureau for many decades, but it hasn't been operational for a long time, and we're going to have it back into operation soon. Um, the next version of the <coughs> city ensemble is also going to have data assimilation. And what that will do for us, we'll get radar data in. So normally, um, radar data is pretty hard to stuff into a model, and a lot of work has been done as to the best ways to do that. And so we're now ready to do that with the next version of our high-resolution model. And that will really help us to do a better job with high-impact weather, with storms, with making sure the storms start in the right place and have the right kinds of intensities when the model kicks off, rather than having to let the model grow the storms and spin up. Okay, so that was the modeling. So the next thing that you would need to do is some processing of that data. So remember that model output is not the same thing as a forecast. You need, there's still several steps that you need to go through. So we do different kinds of technical post-processing to shrink it down or to, to pull out chunks of the map. Um, we do a lot of statistical um, or dyna statistical dynamical post-processing to remove biases, to apply calibration to um, downscale to um, point locations. So, you know, just done from historical matching of, of model output and, and um, observation data. We might composite a few models together or a few um, runs of the model to create a, a, what we call a poor man's ensemble. 
And then there's the whole product generation process too. So all of this stuff happens centrally, the creation of charts, the creation of probability forecasts from ensemble members, um, generating alerts and warnings. A lot of this can be done by a machine. And it's, if you can do that, you save yourself a lot of time and gain a lot of accuracy. So the next step in the chain is going to the forecasters. Um, but to do that, they need systems. And that's not a simple thing, too. You can't just, you know, buy one on, over the internet. You, you have to, they're quite specialized to, to weather services. So many of the systems that we use in the Bureau of Meteorology are ones that are common to other MET agencies. Um, the graphical forecast editor, where forecasts work on editing grids, um, is an American thing. We have something called visual weather, which is a number of MET agencies use. We also have homegrown systems. So we have a thunderstorm interactive forecast system. We have a tropical cyclone module. We have a few other ones that we've done ourselves. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. It's complicated. Um, we're having to upgrade the software because it's not secure enough. So it's, it's a real, um, it's a bigger thing than you might imagine um, in a MET agency. So the next link in the chain is our forecast and warning services. Um, I've just put a, a screen grab from the Bureau's um, front page website. If you, if you scroll down to the bottom of it, which you probably don't tend to do, but you'll, if you do, this, you'll see that bit on the left, which is kind of a, a schematic showing the different kinds of services that we offer. We also have um, video. We have um, seasonal climate and water outlooks um, that are done every month in Canberra, usually. And importantly, um, down in the bottom right, we have meteorologists that are embedded in agencies. So they work for the Bureau, but they go to work every day at the Victorian Fire Service or the Sydney Rural Fire Service or AEMO, the Energy Agency. And they're embedded in the operations of the client or the customer or the agency to provide weather advice and to interpret weather data, um, give specialized forecasts, and so on. And that we're finding this is a really, really effective way to get impact from our forecasts is to have embedded nets. So let's look at a warning. Um, and I'll, I'll put tropical cyclones up because it's, it's easier to find graphics for that. Um, so we, we have graphical um, depiction of the, of the warning, which is spatial in nature. Um, it came as a little bit of a surprise to me that lots of people just don't get maps at all. You know, we're, we're used to looking at maps. This is the world that we in this room live in, but many people don't. And so words continue to be important. The tropical cyclone warnings for many, many, many decades and probably the whole, the whole history of tropical cyclone warnings has been text. It can be read on the radio. It can be flashed on your TV screen. And, there's, um, and the kind of information in it can be quite detailed. So it depends on if you read the whole thing. Um, or if you just sort of start with the headline information. But it includes some very specific advice or information on where the cyclone is and how intense it is and where it's going and all that. But then when you, if you read right down, and a lot of people don't because it's pretty long, um, description of the hazards. So what are the winds likely to be? Where is the storm tide or the storm surge likely to go? Um, are you going to need to? Um, do something about it. So what are the actions that you need to take? Um, and then, of course, the issue time for the next warning, because these, these do change with time. But um, obviously, text is not the, the most friendly way to do things. And so we're now moving much more towards videos, tweets, Facebook, telephone, um, and who knows where that's going. I think we're looking at Instagram as another way to get forecast information out. And, um, we've got a whole group in the Bureau that's, that's concentrating on how to best communicate. And then the last link in our chain um, are our customers. Okay, who's the customers? It's, it's a word that so I started feeling kind of uncomfortable about at first, but I've gotten quite used to it, like a lot of managerial type words. You, you do grow to get used to them. But the Bureau's strategy is all about serving the customer. So we have a, a new director. This is, we're very outward focused now and on providing impact and value. So who are the stakeholders for our weather information? Um, on the left-hand side are the, the ones that we traditionally think of, so the public, emergency services, 
Aviation, huge. Aviation cannot operate without weather forecasts. Primary industries like ag, maritime, water. But over on the right-hand side are a lot of other customers, in quotes, for, for weather information. The resource sector of, of oil and gas and mining, construction. These people are all working outside. They might need to evacuate if something bad comes along. Um, defense, renewable energy, so wind, solar, waves. Um, and then Andy talked about insurance, tourism, and increasingly public health. So we've done um, a bit of work. Um, there's a, a team in the Bureau that's going out and talking to our customers to try and, and get a real in-depth picture of what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what they don't understand. And, th and this project is called Voice of the Customer. And so I'll just read you a couple of the, the feedbacks that have come back, because um, we're working on designing a new website. First one, the Bureau website, get a bit frustrated. I've got to sit down and think about where to find it and try and to navigate to there. Okay, not good. All we get from the heat wave service are low res maps with yellow, orange, and red blobs. It's really hard to know what those, what areas are affected. So we can't zoom and pan. I mean, that's sort of fundamental stuff these days. We've got to get to that. You're giving information but not advice. I think there's an opportunity to build on the forecast and provide resources to assist people in identifying hazards and risk. And I'll come, I'll come back to that later in the talk. Well, we do have a couple of social media sites in the territory that are quite active, and I'm monitoring those to get a sense of excitement. So up in the, emergent, in the, in the territory, they're um, eager to see what, what's coming over the social media. So let's go back to our value chain. This is, this is what I showed you before. And um, um, look at the right-hand side. We go from, from forecast and warning services out to the customers. <coughs> let's, let's unpack that a little bit. There's a few other things that need to be done well in order for that link to, to be an effective link. So the forecasts have to be disseminated, and we talked about video and internet and so on. Whoever is receiving them needs to understand them. So if we don't put them, it frame them in a way that the people who are receiving it can understand what we're trying to tell them, it's going to make them very hard for them to do anything about it. Then they need to make, be able to make a decision. Sometimes you could warn somebody about something, but if they're not in a position to act on it, they won't, there won't be a benefit of that warning to them. So they have to be able to do something, and, and there may be ways that we can assist with that. So let's, let's take a look at this value chain for a particular example. So one of, one of the um, important warnings that we do or we assist with is fire weather prediction. You might be interested to know that, that the warnings for um, total fire bans don't come from the Bureau. They come from the fire agencies themselves. They own those warnings. And we might broadcast it on our, on our channels, but actually the decision sits with the agencies themselves. So they, they need to um, have this value chain working for them, and then it's going to come back and go out to you via them or the Bureau, or, and the Bureau, I should say. So what does the chain look like? Um, we'll start in the top left with the observations, weather observations, but we also need fuel, fire fuel. So is the grass dry? Are the trees green and healthy, or are they dead? Are they going to burn faster? How much? Um, we do some modeling. So we do our weather modeling, which is an important input, of course. But we're also starting to now do fire behavior modeling. And that's quite exciting. And that's, I think that's an area that's going to evolve into something really, really useful. Um, we need to post-process those forecasts. Similarly, um, we have systems and operations. And when it comes to this, um, we must be able to pan and zoom and look in detail at, at areas where there's hills and valleys where fire, may, fire behavior may be a little bit different due to topography, or there may be population living there. And where are the roads and where are the vulnerable areas? So um, systems and operations are really critical there. Um, I mentioned the embedded meteorologists before, and many, most of our states now have a, a bureau person sitting with the fire agency. Um, we have, to, well, dissemination of the forecast and warnings need to be put out to anybody who's in danger, so you know, have different ways to do that. Apps are starting to become more common. Um, perception and interpretation, this is where a lot of training community engagement, consultation, that needs to happen there so that people know and understand what they're getting. 
decision making um, for the agencies. That's often, do we go in and fight this fire? How do we, how do we um, respond? Might be a go, no go decision, risk analysis. Um, and only then, if once you get all those things right, do you really get maximize your community benefit. OK, so what we're going to do next is we're going to design a new warning service. So I'll set the scene for you. Um, how many people remember the thunderstorm asthma event that happened about a year and a half ago? OK, anybody here affected by that event? OK. Um, I don't know if you've been watching your nightly news, but there's a coronial inquest going on this week in Melbourne about this event. And in fact, today and probably right at this moment, the Bureau of Meteorology is testifying on the, on the event of what information they provided during this event. Um, although the, the headline there, this came out the next day, two people had died, ultimately 10 people died in this event, and over 10,000 people had to either go to hospital or get some kind of medical assistance. The, the plot on the right shows the ambulance call-outs. The, the blue line is what you expect as a function of time of day. And it's ticking along just, just as per normal until about um, 5 or 5.30 going home time. And then all of a sudden, it just goes through the roof. And this was a, an event that was unprecedented. Um, the, the health system kind of didn't know how to respond to it. They didn't know what it was for, in the first place. Um, people were just not breathing, calling ambulances. Pretty soon they were out of ambulances. There were no more ambulances. And um, yeah, it was, it was just an awful situation. Um, and it, to the credit of the health sector, they responded as best they could. And they saved, may, they, they saved almost all those lives. So a lot of people, a lot more people would have died if the health sector hadn't been able to respond as well as they did. But they were really stretched beyond their limits. And so. Um, the health department came to the Bureau of Meteorology and said, well, we can't have this happen again. So we'd like to work with you to develop a new warning service for epidemic thunderstorm asthma so that we can serve the health sector, serve the population, educate people, and provide warnings if something like this is, is imminent. So if you're going to develop a warning service, you need to understand the phenomena that you're warning so that you know what you're looking for. So this diagram shows our, our best understanding, which is not very good, of what we think happens in these events. So there's, there's really a couple of ingredients. The first one is pollen. And so um, ryegrass pollen is the one we think is the culprit here in Australia, in Southeast Australia. These events do happen a little bit in Europe to a lesser extent, and it might be birch pollen or it might be olive pollen. Here it's ryegrass, so pasture land. And this is actually a, a planted crop. Um, and somehow it gets broken up. We don't know the mechanism. We think it may have to do with moisture. We're not absolutely sure. Um, but it, seem, it, it also needs a concentration mechanism. So this might be in the air all the time at low levels, but somehow it got to very extreme levels. And this is where we believe the thunderstorm comes in. And remember Rob talked about the gust front or the downdraft outflow. In that area where the, all the turbulence you have air masses colliding. So if there's, if there's pollen in the air and it's getting broken up or it's been broken up by moisture, somehow it's getting concentrated right at that boundary. And if it goes across an area where there are vulnerable people, that's when trouble occurs. Um, and in this particular event, everyone who ha struggled with it had allergies or hay fever at the very least. But most of those who actually died didn't know that they were allergic to pollen. They might have known they had hay fever, but they weren't taking medication to um, relieve any hay fever symptoms or asthma symptoms. And then, then when they had this concentration, extreme concentration of starch granules that got into their lung and, and caused the allergic reaction, they had no way to respond to it other than to, to wait for the ambulance. So this is kind of what we think happens. And we're building our service using this as our conceptual model. OK, so let's, let's start with our value chain. OK, now we've got dissemination, perception, interpretation, decision making in there. And we're going to work backwards to try and design a warning service that makes sure that we cover every aspect of our value chain. OK, so right from the start, our customer is the health department. 
uh, and in Victoria in particular. And the objective is enhanced community safety and emergency response during epidemic thunderstorm asthma events. So we'll start at the right. That's where we were trying to get to. So what's the decision? Well, I'm going to open this, this up to everybody here. What's, what decision do you think needs to be made? Yeah, just, just shout it out. Like resourcing, getting more ambulances out there, getting hospitals ready to accept more people if necessary. Yep, yep. Anything else? Stay indoors. Yeah, protect yourself. Yep. Okay, let's, let's keep going. What about perception and interpretation? What do we need to cover here to make sure that this is done well? Everyone is aware that there's a hazard. Yep, very good. Maybe aligning risks for vulnerable groups? Yep. So some, some community education, perhaps? OK. Um, what about dissemination? How, how will um, these warnings be shared? Social media? Yep. Text messaging? Yep. Do you can type the form on the screen? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. That's, um, I think, that, I think we, haven't, we haven't had to invoke that, but that's certainly a mechanism. When the, the most severe weather events come along, that's what we use. Yep. Messaging the public for DHHS. Absolutely. And so hospitals and ambulance, police, community, they'll all get tailored messages for them. And through a whole variety of channels. So the ones that you named um, online as well, you can, um, so. Okay, so what kind of um, service provision do we need to support that? I'll tell you that one. That's the, so the Bureau, the Bureau needs to provide the, the, the warning of um, the environmental conditions for epidemic thunderstorm asthma. So we are making forecasts for pollen. We're making forecasts for the convergence lines. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later what, what we came up with there. Um, Okay, let's, let's work backwards a little bit more. Forecast systems and operations. What do we need to do in order to be able to produce those services? Any idea? Okay, well, we, we need to make thunderstorm forecasts or somehow forecast convergence lines. So all, all of the forecasting tools that we use for convec convective weather with downdrafts, we need to be using those things. Um, so this, this is sort of getting back in the weather realm, mostly, mostly. So the post-processing of model outputs, we're looking ahead a couple of days, as well as just the next couple of hours. It's a, it's a service that extends over a few different time ranges. We're doing modeling, of course. We need to model the weather. We need to observe the weather. We also need to observe the pollen and model the pollen as well. So those, those are the elements that need to be included in the service. We ran a workshop with the health department to work through some of those things with them and understand what it was that they needed to, um, to have in order to alert all of their people. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff on here. I don't expect you to read it. But one of the main points is they need it on a whole variety of time scales. And if you look at out on the right-hand side, they need seasonal information. Is it a, is it a wet winter? Are we going to have a, a lot of grass producing a lot of pollen? If it's like this year, it was quite a dry winter. We didn't have much grass. We didn't have much pollen. It, and, you know, was, wasn't a, a worrisome type of a year, but the previous year had been. Um, all the way down to days and hours and now, what's happening now. And in fact, we can, um, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Health Department can talk to each other on the phone if there's an event that looks like it's unfolding. And then go back and analyze afterwards. This is our sort of compressed value chain for this. So we put in a number of um, new pollen counting, um, pollen traps. And if you're interested in that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, enhanced med observations, um, remote sensing, forecast and data processing. Um, so we have some special forecasting now that we've developed just for, um, for thunderstorm asthma. It, it sits in a service. And we've got some, some thresholds on which to base our alerts to the health department. And that enables them to make the decisions on what to do. 
Okay, so part of the um, development of this new warning service was working really closely with the health department, with our customers, to um, not just understand what their needs were, but to work through with them how we intended to respond and let, you know, have a bit of back and forth of whether that was going to work for them. And so um, that's, that's what's going on in the photos there. We workshopped a few times, um, we made some plans. And what we ended up with this year was a very simple decision tree because we don't have the science well enough um, understood to, to, to do a lot better than this. So we're basing the forecasts on a combination of the, the chance of a severe thunderstorm that has downdrafts. And if it's a squall line like it was on, on that event, it gets a little bit more worry. Um, and then the pollen count, predicted or observed. Okay, and so if we have low pollen, it doesn't really matter what, what the weather's doing, it's not a risk. But if you've got high pollen and you've got those weather conditions, it's a high risk. And when I say high, we really can't put an absolute value on it. It's still a very rare event. You can have all of the things lining up and you still don't have a problem. And we don't understand why. Um, but it's a relatively high risk and you, you would want to at least be aware and take preventative actions if you could. So in the space of less than a year, we managed to spin up a, a pilot service. Um, it, we, I mentioned the enhanced pollen observations. We make it during the springtime, October to December in Victoria. And you can go to the Vic Emergency website, sign up for their app, and you get an alert. Um, and that's, that's how the forecasts are disseminated to the public. The health department has its own means for disseminating it within the health sector. Um, we also have a three-year research project to try and um, tackle some of the unknown science. So we're still not um, perfect at, at predicting thunderstorms, but at the Bureau we feel kind of comfortable. That's bread and butter for us. So we're really focusing most of our efforts on the pollen prediction. Um, and Jeremy Silver, who's married to, to Claire, who's part of this, the um, Center of Excellence, is one of the scientists on the project. He's doing a fantastic job. Um, with the, the pollen modeling, we have some dispersion forecasting that we're testing out. We're um, trying to get a better sense of the vegetation state by using um, satellite data, satellite vegetation, and also a time-lapse photography to give us the ground truth of what, what's happening with the grass. Is the grass blooming? Is the pollen flying away? We can see that with a camera if we're smart and then, and then tie that to the satellite data to try and get the spatial picture. Um, and pollen size and distribution. What's causing the pollen to break up? And is there any way that we can measure that? Um, it's not clear whether there is, but there might be. OK, so I'm going to finish the rest of the talk um, moving towards people-centered warnings. So the kind of warning that's been issued traditionally for many years, and we're a little better than this now, but would be a warning something like severe thunderstorms are expected with wind gusts exceeding 90 kilometers per hour. So if you saw something like this, would you worry? I don't know, maybe. So what if we said severe thunderstorms with gusts over 90 kilometers an hour will result in damage to trees and power lines? This is about where we're at now with our, with our warning service. So we're, we're saying a little bit more about what will happen. How about this one? Extensive delays in Kensington may occur due to the risk of large trees downing power lines and blocking roads as a result of thunderstorms. How do you like that one? It's a little better. It's telling you a little bit more. And it's, it's, not, it's not only telling you what the weather will be and what we'll do, but it's, it's getting pretty precise about where it's going to be as well. So if you live in Kensington or you have to drive through Kens Kensington on your way home, you might think, oh, I'll go a different way, or I I'll, I'll wait a while. So um, the difference between these, these three types of warnings, the first one is really only looking at, at the hazard, at the weather. The second one is starting to get into the vulnerability area by saying that the trees and power lines could be um, affected by the weather. But the third one is including exposure. So who's going to be affected um, and when and that kind of thing. So drivers, Kensington, um, and probably all of these should say what time of day it is as well. So that's, um, so really, it's not just what the weather will be, but what it might do, and importantly, how it's going to affect you. 
So if we want people to take action and we just tell them what the weather is, that's not nearly as effective as, 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 as if they understand, oh my gosh, this is going to affect me. I better do something. <coughs> so sort of more broadly, if we, if we um, move away from just winds, but we look at all the kinds of things that we predict, um, you know, we make forecasts already for all the things on the left-hand side. At the Bureau, we're, we're doing a lot to address hazard prediction as well. So we, we um, have warnings for wind gusts, floods, storm surge, waves, um, bushfire weather, heat wave advice at least, um, and starting to get into air pollution as well. And you could probably add other hazards to that list. Um, but where we want to get to is the impact of those so that the decisions on the kinds of actions that you might take to mobilize staff, to issue follow-on warnings for for those impacts that may be specific to that particular hazard and context. You want to reroute the traffic, cancel your operations, implement some kind of backup, you know, bring more staff on, um, prepare hospitals. You know, a lot of people are um, going to be um, affected by heat. You want to get um, your hospitals ready to, to cool them down or treat them. And uh, the arrows go really both ways. So if, you, if you're trying to make those predictions, you might have some kind of modeling that you're doing, um, which starts with the weather and, and the hazard. You might have to have some kind of hazard model, like fire behavior or storm surge. Um, but then to get to the impact, you really do need to have the vulnerability and exposure to get you that risk. Um, and then the, the decision makers need to feed the information back. How well is it working? Are they getting what they need? What data have they got that we need to know? So what were the impacts? A lot, you know, if you want to know about trees down, the Weather Bureau doesn't know about trees down, but forestry does. And so can we get that data if we want to know about um, how far something was flooded? That's not us collecting that data. That's somebody else. So um, what was the impact and what's some data that we can use? So the key elements, I think this is a sort of repeating. You need to have the weather and climate extremes that goes into some kind of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability to get the impact. And then you, you put it into a sort of a feedback loop as well so that you can improve what you're doing um, and, and improve it. And I put this slide up just as a reminder to myself that internationally this is a big thing. And you see it a lot in um, disaster risk reduction and cli climate adaptation. But what we don't yet have um, is, in a real tactical sense, when we're making a warning, to try and warn for the impact in real time. So that's where we're trying to get to. Um, I'll show a couple of examples of the world leaders in this area, which is the UK Met Office. Um, they lead in a lot of things, and this is one of them, of actually doing hazard impact modeling and then giving that information to their forecasters and different emergency managers, because they have the whole embedded meteorologist thing as well. Um, they've got one for storm surge, where they're using ensembles to um, get a number of scenarios for storm tide, water depth, wave height, and things like that in storms, make, putting it into a map and a time series, which um, I would say this one's probably focused for emergency managers or people who are um, more sophisticated than the general public. There's another one, which is a well-known one in our community, um, hazard uh, vehicle overturning. So they have a problem with um, very strong winds, particularly in Scotland, but all over, all over the country, um, of trucks blowing over. And if the truck blows over, that snarls up, well, it's bad for the truck, bad for the driver, but it also snarls up the traffic. And so the thing that's interesting about this is it's a pretty well understood, um, from an engineering point of view, phenomenon. So if you can, you can model the wind load on a truck and what it takes to blow it over. You can also model the time of day when people are on the roads. And so this is a dynamical um, forecast of road interruption, kind of. And, and so that's, that's an important impact. And um, another one that they've worked on, um, this is not available to the public yet. I'm hoping that it will be. Um, again, for their sort of their international um, audience, is what they call the global hazard map. And again, ensemble forecasts, every one of these is ensemble forecasts because you need that to, to get to the risk, to the probability. Um, and they're looking at impacts or the probability of heat waves, the probability of flooding due to heavy rain, and those kinds of things. 
And they're actually going to the news feeds, wherever they can find them, to verify whether those things that they predicted actually happened and calibrate this impact model. And this is a product that mainly is for their own forecasters to use because they, the, the Met Office, the, the British Empire is sort of alive and well still in some ways. <laughs> so, um, you know, very keen to understand what's going around the world. And disaster agencies are, are working with the Met Office to evaluate and use some of these products. And in fact, the Bureau's got a collaboration. Our, the heat wave index is one of the things that's, that's being used there. So I want to um, just really very, very briefly describe um, some work that the Bureau and the Geoscience Australia are doing together. And in fact, Serena, who's sitting in the front corner there, is on this project to um, start d working on impact forecasting in Australia. It's real toe-in-the-water stuff. But we're starting with ensemble forecasts, high-resolution ensemble forecasts for rain and wind um, from high-risk models. We're trying to use vulnerability curves or relationships between the hazard and what might happen to buildings. So buildings is one of the sorts of infrastructure that we know a little bit more about than maybe some other things. And Geoscience Australia also has a very nice geospatial data set called Nexus, National Exposure Information System. So all the demographic information, where are the roads, the hospitals, the old people, the the immigrants, you know, all of that stuff is, is in there to varying degrees. You can imagine in the city of Sydney it's pretty good, but maybe somewhere in western New South Wales it's not very good. And if you have all that information and you put it together in a smart way, what we want to be able to provide to Bureau forecasters and emergency managers is a spatial, temporal, probabilistic view of the impact of that extreme weather. So we're um, in the, the early days of it. It's proving to be quite challenging because um, although we have pretty good meteorological knowledge, a lot of the other information is patchy in a lot of places. Um, we're doing an East Coast low case study with this, and it's, and it's in New South Wales, so you might expect the data to be pretty good, but it's not as good as we'd like, and there's bits of um, hazard information that we don't have. So it's, it's going to be something that evolves over time as we grow to understand what's needed, what's possible, and how to work together. So this, I would say that this project at the moment is largely focused on how do we work together as partners, Bureau, Geoscience Australia, emergency managers, to have a sort of an end-to-end real-time forecast of impacts, um, hazard impacts, and it might not be very good, but we're, it's, it's a starting place. That's where we're trying to get to and demonstrate it. Some of the challenges, and I'll, I'll um, acknowledge the Met Office for this, um, of which there are many. Um, there's all kinds of impacts and vulnerabilities. So one pi population might be vulnerable to one thing, where another part might be quite comfortable with that thing, but they're vulnerable to something else. So how do you, how do you cover all that? The mechanisms, um, not always very well understood. We think that Falling trees are probably responsible for a lot of the disruption due to East Coast lows, but we don't really know what makes a tree fall <laughs> over. I mean, how do you model that? Um, social sciences. People make funny decisions as well. So behavioral sciences. You, one of the findings out of the Black Saturday bushfires was that even when people were warned, they were often unable to act because they were kind of paralyzed or, or too frightened to do anything. So you don't you don't necessarily anticipate that that's going to happen. So getting a message out is not necessarily the same thing as people taking responsible action. Um, lack of consistent observations. This is a real problem. And for us as a national agency, wanting to provide national services when different states and different municipalities all do things differently, um, it's, it's just going to be constantly a challenge. These events are rare, too. So it's not like you can collect lots and lots of data, do a statistical mashup, and there you go. And, and I think there's a perception out there in part of the community that's all you need to do. You just get enough data together, throw it into your neural net or whatever, and the answer will emerge. It's not that simple, believe me. Um, inconsistent reporting, data, data again. Um, yeah, data, data, data. <laughs> 
Uh, it's partnerships. I've mentioned partners before, um, and you saw a slide sort of similar to this in Andy's presentation where risk is in the middle, you've got vulnerability, hazard, exposure. But all of these things on the outside are influencing your ability to actually address that risk. So the politics, which is, is worse than, you know, it's, it's a bigger fact than that we want it to be. But um, demographics, urbanization, and, and so on, climate change. And so partnering is so important because for us at the Weather Bureau, we have a little bit of that information, but most of that belongs to somebody else, and it's their domain of expertise. So if we want to get to making warnings for high-impact weather, we have to partner. And so I've just um, put on this sheet um, a number of organizations in Australia or internationally who are all working in this area. We are partnering. We must need to partner a whole lot better to get there. And there's some pretty good national leadership on the emergency management side to try and make this happen. But it's, it's an area that's still um, evolving, I would say. And I, I wouldn't um, underestimate the bottom, the technology industry, um, for additional capability. A lot of the modeling that we might need to do might need to involve a whole lot of different kinds of data. And even the meteorological data volumes alone are huge. We need a supercomputer. When you start putting a whole lot of other information, economics and um, you know, environmental information, you very quickly um, need some pretty good technology to manage that. And some work that I've seen from IBM where they did collect all the data and they registered it, co-registered it. So it was all on a common time space grid um, so that it was easy to use and then made that available to the community to start modeling and start exploring relationships. Um, I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, uh, this, I put this slide up just as a, as a reminder that Although we have some knowledge of disaster risk, and I think this, this um, Center of Excellence is going to do some great work there, and maybe we can detect and monitor and analyze and forecast these things, those two bottom ones, warning dissemination and communication, communication, that's a, that's a social science expertise. Preparedness and response capability, that's largely a social science area of expertise. So th some of our most important partners are going to be people working in the social sciences area. And we're not very good at that. We need to get better. It's been identified in a National Academy report in the US. Um, and so we're, we're starting to do that. But that's, that's another area. And I, I don't know what the Center of Excellence here has got planned for that. But I would really encourage you to, um, where you can, to engage with the social scientists as how to make that information useful. OK, and I'll just finish off now with a plug for a project that I'm involved in. And if you've, if you've been to Amos, you might have heard me talk about this. Internationally, there's, through WMO, the World Weather Research Program, there's a project called High Impact Weather. And it's a very application, stakeholder-focused project. It's 10 years. And it's trying to cover the whole span of that weather information value chain. So we, um, as meteorological scientists, tend to work mostly, if we look at those five pillars, pr predictability and processes, that's what this Center of Excellence is all about. So that's very exciting. We'll see some new work there. For us in the Weather Bureau, um, we also work on forecasting, multi-scale forecasting. But then we start to get to the right to areas that we're a little less um, in engaged with traditionally. Vulnerability and risk, we know it's important, but we need to get better at using that information, contributing to it. Communication, working with our social science colleagues, and evaluation of this whole thing as well. So not just verifying the accuracy of forecasts, but evaluating the effectiveness of warnings and impact predictions when we don't have data on what the impacts are. So it's, it's a real challenging area. Um, the project is focusing on five types of hazards. Initially, they sort of said all hazards and were told to go back and um, limit themselves. But they had to <laughs> still ended up with five. So local extreme winds, which would include not just tropical cyclones, which are a big deal here, but also any kind of wind from frontal systems, outflow boundaries, et cetera. Urban heat waves and air pollution. Heat wave, huge issue here. Air pollution, a little less so, although it might 
it might surprise you to know that it kills lots and lots of people, even here in a clean country like Australia. Disruptive winter weather, we probably can ignore that one, mostly. Um, urban flood, though, and Brisbane floods is a, a perfect example of if we had um, more effective warnings and, and um, understanding and ways of conveying it, there might have been a better response to that. And wildfire, big issue for us, and I think we can um, take credit for making sure that wildfire was w among the five that was included. Um, working with stakeholders, um, the Bureau of Meteorology has got scientists working in each of those five pillars. I'm leading the, the task team on evaluation. Um, and then Michael Reeder is on the advisory panel for the project, representing the academic sector. So Australia is um, well engaged, but I would like to invite you all, if you're interested in um, learning more about what's happening in this international project or even getting involved yourself, just come and talk to me, send me an email, and um, we'll see what we can do. And finally, I just want to make a plug for a, a workshop that's happening um, week after next at University of Melbourne. It's related to that international project. It's an AMOS workshop on high impact weather predictability and processes. So remember back here, predictability and processes was the first of those, um, those research topics. Uh, it's a half day workshop, free, food provided. All you need to do is RSVP with AMOS. Um, I hope some of you are coming to it. I think it'll be interesting. Um, and the, the workshop will take a sort of a global view of what's the cutting edge of the science as well as an Australian view of what research is going on um, here and, and with, with the speaker. So I'd encourage you all to attend. Um, yeah, so finally, in just way of closing, I'd like to also invite you, if you haven't visited the Bureau of Meteorology, um, come and pay us a visit. If you want to um, understand how forecasts and warnings are made, you can visit our forecast centers um, and learn a little bit more. We have chart discussions at quarter to ten every morning. If you want to come for that, let me know and we can you know, bring you along and you can see what happens there. Um, yeah, I'll finish there. <laughs>